Okay, hello everyone. Well, we're going to be talking about version 13.1 of Wolfram Language and Mathematica, which just uh, was released um, a couple of days ago. And uh, I'm gonna try and do a kind of whirlwind tour of some of what's in it. And you can get some idea from this word cloud at the top of the post that I made about it. Um, the uh, uh, gives some idea of, of some of the functions and creatures of this uh, new version. Just to give you a sense, a little bit more of a sense, this is kind of a, a table of contents of some of the things that uh, we can talk about here. And I'm going to I'm going to go through this rather quickly today, and we may come back another time and go through some things in more detail. At least my plan is to go through it rather quickly, because it's the beginning of our uh, well, it's actually kind of the end of the first week of our summer school and so on. And I have to uh, um, I have to travel in a very short while here. So um, let's talk about what's in version 13.1. So the uh, first thing to say is kind of the bigger picture. We are now at kind of T plus 34 years in terms of the launch of Mathematica and Wolfram language in general, um, the 34th anniversary of, um, uh, of our release was um, just a couple of weeks ago now. Um, and, uh, but it's amazing how much we are able to kind of continue to accelerate the development of what we're doing. One might think that after 34 years, all the stuff that could be done would have been done. That's not true. There's just, uh, uh, there's more and more that we can do as a result of the things that we've already done. We can use the building blocks we've already made to create yet more, and that's exactly what we've been doing. We've been aiming for kind of a twice a year type of release of new 0.1 versions of our system. And uh, we released version 13.0 on December 13th of 2021. And so we're just a little bit uh, more than six months uh, since that time, we are releasing 13.1. And you know, for many people, a 0.1 release is some kind of minor thing that involves a few icons getting changed or something. Uh, for us, that's um, uh, a very different story. In version 13.1, we have 90 completely new functions added to the language and 203 existing functions that have uh, substantial updates. Um, so it's a it's a it's a very um, uh, good crunchy release, um, and there have been about a hundred hours of live streams that we've done over the past few months, uh, talking about the design of these features. Um, and so many of the things you'll see today are things that, if you've been watching our live streams, you will have seen in gestation. All right, well, let's get started. So, uh, first thing to say. First thing to say is we're always trying to kind of tweak the language to make it sort of ever smoother, more ergonomic, more efficient to use. One of the things that I consider to be a very nice feature of uh, version 13.1, um, something I expect to be using a lot, is a new construct called threaded. So ever since version one, we've had this notion of listability and auto threading where that, those uh, two lists will thread themselves together and you get that result. But now let's say that what we want to do um, is to take something like one, two, three, four and um, uh, add to that, add X to the first element and, and uh, Y to the second element. Well, if we were to do this, we would uh, be adding um, X to the whole first element, y to the whole second element. But let's say what we want to do is add x to the first sub-element here, y to the second sub-element, and so on. OK, so there's a new construct that does exactly that. And um, uh, here it is. It's called threaded. And um, <clears throat> what threaded does is to specify that something will be inserted into the, a lower level in a set of nested lists. So it's it's defining to go a level down to do its threading work. So threaded itself, if you just type in threaded, um, then uh, threaded itself is just an inert wrapper. 
Threaded only does something if you are combining it with uh, a, a collection of lists into which things can be threaded. It's kind of a little bit like the nothing uh, object which disappears in lists or the splice object that allows you to splice things into lists and so on. So, okay. So let's say uh, we're taking something like this. We take a table of elements here. Let's say that we want to multiply each element by uh, one, one comma minus one. So the usual way we do that is we'd use, uh, uh, we'd map some, uh, we'd map that function across here. Um, the, um, uh, but but here's, uh, here's the way we can now do it with threaded. We just say, take that table and multiply it by threaded of one minus one. So there's the result. So that's so threaded is this way of inserting things um, into sort of auto threading at a lower level. It's uh, um, so we can um, you can do all kinds of things. You can have multiple threaded all together. It will thread like that. Um, the uh, uh, you can also in, in general what threaded does is to thread at the lowest level of a list. So there's a a, um, a rank three object. If I thread into that, it will, by default, just dive down to the lowest level of the list and thread there. If I were to give an explicit um, element here that says uh, says what level I want to thread at, I could I could do this differently. I could thread now at, um, uh, you can see that this came out with a different result because I was threading at level two rather than the default operation of threaded, which is down at the very lowest level. So as I say, I fully expect that I and many other people will use threaded a lot in programs. It's something that uh, this construct I find myself using uh, very frequently. And now there's just this very simple symbolic wrapper that allows you to do that. So um, let's say we have something like this. We, we have a, um, a uh, uh, image data of this. We'll make RGB triples. So let's say we want to multiply every RGB triple by 0, 1, 2. To, to those color channels, this will now do that. So uh, when we look at um, the, um, we, we, can, we can deal with quite elaborate kinds of things. So if we, if we um, uh, this is, oops, this is threaded, let's do that, but uh, um, this is threaded in its kind of normal operation um, where it's kind of, uh, going down to the lowest level. So what it's doing here is it's taking, so, so this, is, uh, this is something where we've got a rank two object here and it's being threaded into this rank three object here. And it's kind of taking the rank two object at the lowest level in the rank three object and inserting things that way. Okay, so to give a more elaborate example, this is something where we're saying that level one of the, uh, um, thread E, so to speak, is being uh, connected to level two of the thing that it's being threaded into. That's the result we get for that. Um, but if we change that and we say, I don't know, something like um, just this is at level two here, we'll get a different result. Why are we not getting a different result there? Am I confused? Um, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so, so we are the default is that the minus one levels, the lowest levels are being aligned. I'm not sure why I'm, I'm let's see what happens if I were just to say one arrow minus one, will that give a different result? Oh no, it doesn't, doesn't let me do that. So in any case, but the, the basic point is we're thinking about these different um, kinds of arrays and we're asking, how do you thread elements together at different levels in these arrays? We can think about it in terms of tensor indices and things. Um, but the basic point is one's able to do with, with, with standard listability, one is kind of always operating by connecting the top level of one list with the top level of another list. With threaded, what one's usually doing is connecting the bottom levels of those lists together and threading them like that. But one can specify uh, a, different, a different form of threading if one wants to. Okay, so um, in the in the subject of um, kind of um, uh, language conveniences, we got a whole bunch of them. Another one, I don't know why it does this, keeping on doing this, but anyway, the um, uh, another one is uh, delete elements. So this is just saying uh, from 
one list delete all the elements of another list while keeping the order. So this is kind of like complement for, for lists, but complement treats lists kind of like sets and reorders things. This is something which is like, uh, it's, it's like, um, uh, um, like delete duplicates. This is something which is deleting the elements of a second list from the first list while keeping the order the same. Um, so uh, there are various sort of more elaborate versions of delete elements, but here's um, uh, delete uh, adjacent duplicates, a generalization delete duplicates. Um, another thing that we've added is some um, uh, symmetric difference. It's just another essentially set operation. Um, so we can say, uh, um, what are, this is the symmetric difference of the G20 and the EU. Okay, or for example, we can say, um, here's, here's asking, um, uh, this is unique elements is another thing which says, given a list of a collection of lists, tell us which elements are in one list, but not in any of the others. So this is telling us which are the unique letters in these different alphabets that do not occur in any of the other alphabets. Okay, another language convenience we're coming to is uh, the story of map apply. So we've had the operation, we've had um, at, at, and um, so we can say f at at, that's, that's apply. We've also had f at at at, um, uh, x, y, u, v. And this is, um, uh, this is doing apply at level one. But when we say f at at, that is equivalent to the full form apply f um, like this. But triple at has never had a full form. Um, for sometimes you want to use at 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 in kind of a disembodied way, um, or for example, you want to use it um, in an operator form. Now there's a function map apply that is uh, triple at. Okay, so um, other kinds of uh, language conveniences. Um, uh, another one, same as. Um, this is essentially giving one an operator form of same Q. Same Q itself is a, uh, can take a variable number of arguments. So it's not suitable to be turned into an operator form, but this is asking for each of the elements here, which one is the same as A, and it gives us that list there. Okay, in, in, in terms of language conveniences, one more is a function called replace at. And so this is, um, we can say replace part to replace a particular numbered part but this is saying um, use replace, but at a specific location, it's kind of like a map out of a replace. Now, this might seem like kind of a detail. The reason replace at is important is that when one's doing things like automated theorem proving, and one wants to state a proof that this is equal to that, you want to say, do this transformation, this transformation, this transformation. You're trying to specify what are those transformations. And to do that, you need a construct like replace at. Okay, so that's a little bit on some language conveniences in version 13.1. Uh, let's talk about something fun, which is the world of emojis. So we were very early to adopt Unicode, the kind of standard for uh, characters and glyphs and so on. We adopted that in the very early 90s. We were even involved in, in specifying some of the uh, mathematical constructs, for example, for, for Unicode. But Unicode, originally, the idea was we're going to have 65,000 possible uh, glyphs, and that's going to cover the glyphs of the world. Well, of course, the world is bigger than that, and it didn't really cover all the glyphs of the world. Um, and so gradually, Unicode expanded beyond 16-bit specifications of characters. That was considered plain zero of Unicode to uh, larger specifications, like 32-bit representations of characters allowing 4 billion possibilities. So the, it's not a trivial thing to say, oh, let's just support um, those bigger Unicode characters because we've got lots of strings and we've got lots of efficiency in packing elements of strings into single bytes and things like this. So it's been kind of a long and complicated road to support um, uh, things like 32-bit Unicode characters and the other features of kind of non-plane zero Unicode. But finally, in version 13.1, we're there. We've uh, different versions. We've had some support in the kernel. Now we also have support in the front end and so on. And uh, let, let's take a look at what all of this means. Well, here's an example of um, 
sort of ordinary Unicode that's in the ordinary range within the 16-bit range where we're poking into some piece of, I don't know what this is, some, uh, some, some uh, piece of character space, so to speak. Now let's go, let's jump above uh, 65,000. Let's go above uh, to the 16. Let's find out what's there. Well, what's there? It might have been, we, we might think of this as an archaeological find. This is cuneiform from, I guess, I don't know, uh, Akkadian or something. I don't really know. Um, I think that's a number symbol there. But in any case, that's that's one of the findings in, in sort of beyond Plane Zero Unicode. There are all kinds of um, important, interesting glyphs for all sorts of purposes that are to be found there. And we now support doing computations with those things. I should say that in order to actually render those things on your computer, um, you will have to have fonts. And we have um, support for various kinds of general fonts that cover a large part of Unicode. OK, another thing to be found in uh, above 65,000, um, uh, above characters, uh, uh, above the 65,000 um, limit of 16-bit Unicode are emoji. So if you go to this part of uh, character space, look at that. You've got all kinds of emoji. Um, now, again, the rendering of these may vary from one computer to another, um, but uh, this is the specification of, um, uh, of characters, effectively, which are, so if I, if I try and take some of these characters here, like so take that character there, and um, I just make a string out of it, I could say, um, you know, two character code of this, and it will just be a character there. Okay, so you can you can use emoji um, just like any other characters in Wolfram language. So there's a wolf and a ram, and you're expanding it to power eight, and there you get um, uh, that uh, that sort of tangle of animals, um, and uh, that that's the result. Now, on on a typical computer, like on on a Mac, like I happen to be using here. Um, control command space brings you up an emoji chooser and um, you get to um, uh, specify your emoji and you get to type them in and you can do that in more language and you can do that both in uh, in a code cell and in a text cell let's change this to a text cell okay there we go um, the cat section um, here it is with a with an emoji there um, so um, we in, in version 13.1, so, so as I mentioned, one of the issues with emoji is you may or may not have fonts corresponding to particular emoji. So here I've I've probed a piece of character space that doesn't happen to be supported there. Um, I guess what has happened here, oh, it's a little bit surprising. I thought we have a font here that is um, uh, a Twitter font that I thought contained, yeah, it contained, that's very strange. The thing that I'm seeing here in the post that I made is completely wrong um, because it's, uh, it's, it's not showing the, um, uh, actually, I'm, I'm very confused by this because this says Twitter color emoji, and those are clearly not color characters there. Um, but in any case, this is, this is part of the jungle of modern uh, sort of character space um, that some of these things may vary from one computer to another. All right, so that's a little bit on emoji, support for emoji. Uh, you can now have them any way you want. Um, we've also supporting uh, various kinds of grapheme clusters, um, composite characters, something that shows up in a variety of languages like Hindi. I think this is in Hindi. These are two characters which combine into one sort of uh, uh, um, uh, one character there. Um, so on their own, these characters, that's, that's the first of those characters, that's the second of those characters, but if the characters appear next to each other, they combine into kind of a single character composite like that. Um, it's, you can do the same kind of thing for crit diacritical marks like umlauts. There's a combiner character that creates an O umlaut. Um, in that particular case, there's also a, a single character version, but if we take this version, um, that version, if we say what are the characters in that O umlaut, it will show as the O and the combiner character. Now, this is a whole complicated thing because it means that when you see a character like that, there are potentially multiple different forms of a thing that visually looks like that. There's one that's a single character version of O umlaut as well. And so there's this notion that we actually added in version 13 of, um, uh, of character normalize 
this is a particular normalization of that character. Um, I think that normalizes it to a combiner character. Um, and uh, maybe that maybe that particular one is is normalizing it to no that that one is normalizing it to a single character when that's possible. So now even though here that character had two characters in it, now it only has one character in it. Um, but you can form if you form a character um, that like a, a a z umlaut that isn't something for which there is a single character form. So when we try and character normalize it, it will stay as a, as a two character grapheme cluster. Okay, in the world of emoji, there are some crazy things that happen. Um, so for example, if I take the emoji, the uh, I think it's emoji for, for woman, um, that's at that character position. If I take the emoji for microscope, um, that's at that character position. And there's a notion of a zero width joiner, not a character you can see, but there it is. If we take um, the combination of woman, zero width joiner, microscope, and this is something I consider completely insane, but um, it's uh, uh, that, that something like this would work, um, that will make a, an emoji for supposedly for a, a, a woman scientist. The fact that there's that kind of uh, semantic calculus is, to me, uh, it's it's just a uh, to a language designer like me, it kind of um, it kind of pains me to see something like this because it's so kind of ca carving off such a very arbitrary small corner of things. But for example, you can do the kind of fun of taking sort of the outer product of um, uh, uh, the the um, the the guys and gals thing together with various kinds of uh, rockets and wrenches and so on. And you get these uh, various um, uh, forms of adorned people. Um, I think this is crazy, but it's kind of fun. Um, there are other combiner things that happen in, 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 uh, in the world of emojis with Unicode. Here's another completely crazy one. You can take these sort of special letters and combine them and you can use them to spell uh, kind of designations of countries or country-like entities, um, and uh, it'll make flags. And then you know something like AH doesn't happen to be a country-like entity, so nothing shows up there. But in other cases, um, you'll have, I'm sure, that CH coming out of Switzerland there and, and so on. Um, so kind of another thing that this is sort of uh, semantics in the world of emojis. I think it's rather crazy but um, it's something that we can now support and it's rather fun. Okay, now, huh, one thing I'm not seeing here, which is really super surprising to me, is uh, one of the big things that's happened in version 13.1 is by default, every notebook has a toolbar. And so here um, we can see the toolbar that would normally come up when I, when I launched this notebook. I think I must have removed this toolbar now, I don't think I can magnify this toolbar. I think I magnify the notebook, but the toolbar stays kind of modest in size. But let me give you a little bit of a tour of this toolbar. So we first of all, we've got um, things for evaluating expressions, evaluate selected cells, and so on. We've got some evaluation controls, like localizing symbols to the notebook, status of parallel kernels. We've also got a big stop button there. We've got some sort of sub pieces of that stop button. That's kind of an abort button there. Um, the, uh, then we've got um, uh, something for inserting a new cell. You can specify that. That's very similar to the tongue that comes up here, um, where you can specify insertion of a new cell. This is the same kind of thing, um, specifying different, um, uh, different um, uh, cell styles. Um, this here is changes the background for a cell. So if I go select a cell, I click that, it will give me a, um, a selector for background colors. Let me make it a purple cell there. There it is. I can put a um, uh, some kind of dingbat character at the beginning of the cell, those kinds of things. So that's changing the cell appearance. Um, then the next button has to do with cell grouping. Um, this is for merging cells, dividing cells, grouping cells, and so on. Um, all of these things are available from the standard menus 
but this is sort of a convenient place on a per notebook basis to kind of be be told it's kind of like a like a right click menu except that it's it's something uh, provided right for the notebook you're in and also is context sensitive and what's here will change depending on whether your selection is inside a text cell or a code cell or whatever else so for example um this uh um uh here is some um, copy input from above that's usually command l um on, on a mac at least copy output from above um this is uh um this is okay this one here has to do with extending the selection so this is something you can do by multi-clicking but now you can also just press this um this button multiple times and it will progressively extend the selection you can see it's extending the selection further out in that expression um, another button here is uh the equivalent of control equals that's for inserting i don't know quite why that is off center there that seems like a wrong thing um but that's uh, that's that's that uh another thing that's here is um let me select this um another thing that's here is an iconize button so that is the same thing that you can get from the right click menu um but that's uh um that's something conveniently from the toolbar um this is for commenting things. Um, next, we have something for inserting. Uh, this is for inserting. Um, this brings up the, uh, right now it brings up the, um, uh, the palette. Why can't I move this palette? Uh, palette for inserting uh, mathy kinds of things. Um, the next um, button brings up our new um, tech import uh me mechanism how does this work i don't know is that right is that a correct thing yes okay that's a correct thing um so that brings up a just like you can bring up a control equals box this brings up a, a tech input box another button here this brings up um a canvas uh next button is a hyperlink button um and then in terms of of cells here this uploads these are these are sort of whole notebook buttons that uploads the uh, notebook publishes it to the cloud um that opens documentation um and the last button is search in the notebook now if i were to go and do this inside um you know a text cell um you would see i think um yes you will see other um other things appear in the toolbar like, for example, you can see something for a button for bolding things, um, a button for in, for turning things into uh, um, kind of the um, code text um, uh, font. Um, here's another button. Let's go into that cell again. Um, this this pull down gives one sort of full control, um, sort of word processor style control of um, uh, of the content of cells. So. Uh, this toolbar is kind of just the beginning of a lot of things you'll see to do with code analysis um, and and so on. This is sort of a place to put all of those kinds of things um, that can be sort of localized to a given notebook. So this is this is sort of the the first uh, default notebook toolbar. There will be this this toolbar will be expanded on in subsequent versions. Okay. Let's see, other user interface uh, features. Um, another one that's uh, sort of just a practical thing is if I type control equals and I type something in here, um, I get my yellow box here. If I copy this yellow box and I copy it into a textual application, um, for example, let me say I copy it into um, uh, I don't know, I might copy it into a piece of email, for example. Um, the, um, uh, um, uh, what I used to get is a big complicated mess. What I will get now is a nice little thing that just says element, L entity, element tungsten. And so that means the textual form, the, the textual copy form of, uh, uh, of entities is now something simple. And that's just a practical, useful thing. Okay, so another thing is the output size limiter. Now, oh, why does it say that? Um, 
That is not what I was expecting. If I just say, you know, range of 100,000, I'll get something that's too big to display here. But now I have something that has a lot more information about this thing. So it says store full expression in notebook. So right now, this output expression is not stored in the notebook. Only this limited size of output is stored in the notebook. If I press this button, it will store the full expression in the notebook. I can also take the whole thing and iconize it. I could also say show all. It also tells me the size and memory of this whole thing will be 0.8 megabytes. So for example, let's go ahead and iconize here. I could say iconize expression in place. Okay, if I do that, I will get the full range of 10 to the five, but now as an icon, um, and that's the full thing. And if I were to look here, it would probably tell me that there's le a length of list of 100,000 and so on. Okay. Uh, other things, oh, there's all sorts of details like the beep function. You might have thought beep wouldn't have any particular arguments, but um, now it does. You can uh, give it a beep so that give it an argument which uh, will feed into the why the beep function here. Uh, we've got a new layout of the preferences dialog, uh, things like that. We've also got something which I don't know whether I can successfully demo to you because it's something that has to do with a particular state of uh, the system. So let me just show it to you in, um, uh, in the piece that I wrote here. This is something where um, when you're using the function repository, one thing that can happen is a function can be updated. And the question is, how do we deal with that update? And what happens is that we get this kind of blue box that comes up. See, the, the problem is you want to just keep going with the computation. When you ask to run this thing, you don't want it that in the middle of some giant computation where you're about to you know, launch the rocket or something, somewhere it says, you know, do you want to update or not? That's bad. Um, so it's taken a kind of a new kind of user interface element where it goes ahead and just runs the computation, but it gives you this kind of blue box that says, by the way, there's a new update available. And it shows you that as, as part of the, what's in the notebook between the input and the output. You can press update now, in which case it will then update and be ready the next time you use this to go ahead and, uh, and use the updated version. Okay, other kinds of things. We've got um, some things with um, uh, large scale code editing. We've got things like uh, uh, sort of a simple, simple thing. I actually can show you back, back over here. Um, a simple thing is uh, line numbering in our uh, package editor. Um, that's a convenient thing, not least because uh, we will increasingly be, be sort of uh, giving metadata about code and so on using by specifying that in terms of line numbers. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, one thing that's kind of uh, come courtesy of the toolbar is um, some things become a lot easier to do. Like let's say I have this image and I want to kind of scribble on this image. Well, I can just create, turn that image into the background for a, where did it go? Uh, help, where did it go? Turn that image into the background for a canvas. Uh, what happens here? I press insert drawing canvas, okay. And so there we go. That turned that, that graphic into something which is now the background for something that I can draw on. So now I can get my whole drawing tools and I can start scribbling on top of this graphic. And then I can evaluate this and I will have the, the graphic as background with my scribbles on top of it. Okay, next topic. Let's talk about trees, which as I said, um, in the, the piece I wrote, continue to grow. We just added trees um, in 12.3. We added the sort of fundamental tree data structure. Um, and, uh, um, and now uh, we've got a bunch of annotation of trees. So for example, you can now specify labels for the uh, edges of trees by giving the specification of what's happening as an association um, rather than as a list. Um, the uh, so lots of tree functions well all the tree functions now support association so nest tree we can now label the edges here um, rather than just giving a list of tree elements we can give an association of tree elements with labeled edges 
Um, there's also something which I've been wanting for a while. If you have just like a random tree here, it's often convenient to be able to just get an unlabeled tree where you're just uh, dealing with the structure of the tree, kind of like a, whoops, with the, um, with the structure of the tree, just like um, uh, you would a, um, uh, a graph without thinking about the labels. So there's now a function unlabeled tree. Think of it a little bit like the undirected graph function, which will take just a graph and turn it into an undirected one. This takes a tree and makes it into an unlabeled tree. OK, um, another thing is um, uh, a uh, another big direction is interconversion between trees and other kinds of expression based objects in our language. So here, this is um, a essentially a data set. You see it's a list of associations here. Um, and uh, uh, there is a function called tree expression, which generates, well, we've, we've had that function before, that generates an expression from a tree, but now you can tell it a target. So this particular uh, tree, we can interpret as a data set, and now we'll get it as a data set here. Um, so, and you can you can kind of go back and forth. We can say here is a tree graph from an expression tree of a data set, and we can show you know how does this how does that data set what is the kind of schema of that data set um, as a as a as a the structure of its expression tree, and that that's the result you get from that. Um, more will be coming along these lines, like XML trees, other kinds of trees, and being able to go back and forth between the kind of the tree representation and the potentially external, something like XML specification, being able to do operations on trees that operate on the XML tree, but being able to use our standard tree operations to do that. So a few other convenience functions for trees. Um, this is, a, here's a random tree. Now we can get what we're calling the root tree. This is just two levels of root tree from the, uh, from the root of that tree. You can also go ahead and um, uh, get the negative level root tree, oops, coming up from the, uh, from the leaves of the tree. Um, that should be the, the uh, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, this goes down. This is the root tree from the root down to level minus two, down to a level two above the, the leaves of the tree. Uh, okay, um, let's see. We've also got uh, all sorts of stuff for annotating trees. So here, why is this not working? Um, the, uh, um, this is taking that tree and annotating it by turning uh, the top tree element style, because the way tree works, this is a tree of that tree. And this, this upper level tree, every, uh, this is a tree of a tree of a tree of a tree of a tree. That's how we represent the an expression form, this tree structure. This is now, uh, taking the top level of that tree and um, giving uh, and, and specifying that it should have element style red. Now um, we've got um, we can go ahead and give this kind of pattern based. It's kind of a a replace part like specification that gives tells us what just happened here. Uh, what's going on? Oh, maybe I'm I've got a different ah. That. I picked a random tree, and so the tree that I have doesn't have these parts that I specified here. Let's try that one. Okay, so now every part whose specification in the tree is one followed by any number of indices followed by one is turned into red. Let's say one comma three goes to blue. That will now, I guess it's already turned it into red. So if I say one comma two goes to blue, oh no, it's, it's got to be one one goes to blue, and that term. Um, uh, no, it's it's some, um, yeah. I already I already had used that. So I think maybe if I just say this, is that going to do that? Yes, there we go. Um, that uh, so this is a way of sort of spraying styles into a tree. Um, and you can do the same thing with edges. Um, you can do the same thing by using a tree element style function. Um, so here, this is a tree element style function which takes the specification of each. Uh, the sort of the part numbering of each element and then grinds it up. And here it's putting a certain hue coloring um, on those different parts. And uh, uh, you can, in principle, you can use um, um, both the part 
uh, specification and the actual data at each tree element to determine the style. And there's an example of that. Um, and uh, you can you can start doing things about tree element shape functions. That's another another new feature. Um, being able to specify what the actual rendering of the tree is by specifying uh, you know what shape each node should be rendered as. Okay, onward. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to get through all of this, but let me let me try. Uh, we've got yet more date handling. A lot of tricky things with dates. We've been adding all sorts of dates are amazingly subtle. So if we say convert months into days, well, how long is a month? Well, it's kind of complicated. Um, uh, so the question of how long a month is comes in when you want to say, I've got a date and I want to say, add something to that date. So for example, I say uh, January 31st, 2022, uh, add a month to that date. How do we add a month? Well, one way to add a month is by sort of the physical notion of a month of it's a 12th of a year. Um, and, uh, you know, the earth moved that far, that will land us on January 2nd, um, on March 2nd. Um, but the default is not to do that. The default instead um, is to add a month by adding, by going to the, uh, by adding, by, by just going a month on. So we're at the end of January here, we'll go to the end of February next. But there's a lot of subtlety to how this works. What happens when you uh, land, you know, the continuous uh, point is different from the point you get to by just sort of doing the name of the month type adding. And so we have added a bunch of functions, method options, like roll forward, will roll forward from this date to the next uh, date that is available um, that, uh, that you can get. So for example, if we go, um, if we get, this is kind of subtle stuff, maybe I should, um, uh, you know, if we get a range of dates here, we can see the effect of kind of um, uh, roll forward and roll backward. So this is an example of uh, roll backward here. Um, uh, this will show that the, those will all, when we, when we add a month um, to each of these dates, it will roll backwards to uh, that one. That one, when we add a month, it, is, it actually has landed on March 1st. So it's, it stays there. Um, we can roll forward. Um, and we can roll over. Um, let's roll forward, um, then roll over. Um, let's see. Okay, roll over has a feature that you can sometimes, um, yeah, it's just a, a different way of specifying what date you want to land on. So that's just an example of, uh, th this is just a lot of subtlety. Um, particularly when you're doing things in finance, it can really matter whether that bond was, um, uh, you know, matured on this date or that date, and it's, you know, some number of months or whatever, and it can matter how it lands. So um, that's another thing we've added here. Okay, let's talk about um, uh, Let's um, let's go ahead and talk about um, um, the uh, uh, some other things in video. We've added a video capture function um, analogous to audio capture. We can just capture things in real time. Let me not try doing that because I'm going to end up with um, uh, some uh, uh, complicated thing. It'll take a while. We've also got video screen capture. What on earth is that? I have no idea what that is. That will capture things from a region of my screen. And so I don't actually know where that region is. It might be up here. I can move around there. Let me see what happens. Um, and OK, that was a little piece of my screen. I got the wrong part of my screen. But that allows me to screen capture. I could direct that. Um, I think with Web Execute, you can open a web browser. If you can't, you should be able to at a particular position on your screen. Um, and then you could capture from that. And that's a good way to do quality assurance, for example, for something um, and that you're seeing on the web, for example. Um, you can go ahead and uh, do all kinds of stuff. Like I have an example here where I did um, uh, video screen capture on the evaluation notebook, which itself was doing a video capture. 
and there you can you can see the result of that. Uh, also in video, we've got um, well, uh, you can you can make a tour video that kind of goes and visits different bounding boxes in a video. So here we're we're dropping in on various different animals in this picture. You can define a path um, in a uh, to uh, for, to make you can make a tour video by taking an image and defining a path in that image. And here we're spiraling into the eye of the wolf um, in this particular image here. Okay, let's change topics. I'm going to talk about um, college calculus. So one thing we've added in version, um, uh, there are a number of things that we've kind of done uh, sort of for simple cases in Wolfram Alpha for many years. And it's always a, a sort of a challenge to bring them up to the kind of level of robustness that um, justifies them being sort of built into the language. Um, but uh, we've, we've done a bunch of that for calculus. This is implicit D. So we're saying uh, differentiate x to the y with the constraint that x squared plus y squared equals one, differentiate y with respect to x. That's the result we get. Um, so we can say, for example, we can just say, take this, um, uh, this and differentiate y with respect to x with that constraint. And so we get the result there. Now, of course, um, because this is now a built-in feature of Wolfram language, it's very general. Um, so this is um, uh, differentiating two variables um, uh, diff uh, with respect to x twice with, the, with these, sorry, it's differentiating x plus y plus z with respect to y and z um, twice with respect to x with this constraint. So we can do all those kinds of things. So this is uh, implicit differentiation. Okay, um, another thing that we've added is the notion of um, sort of a college level calculus concept. Uh, here, we're doing an integral, that's a fancy integral that's getting done. But let's say we just want to be kind of uh, playing ar around with this integral, manipulating the integral. Well, one thing we can do is inactivate the integrate. So now we have an inactive integral here. And we've got a new function called integrate change variables. Um, so what it does is it says, um, take that inactivated integral and for z, make the, uh, um, uh, make the transformation z equals tan x over 2. I don't know. I'm sure that's a trig substitution. I don't think I've, uh, uh, I think I taught computers how to do integrals before I did too many of those things by hand myself back in the day, now 44 years ago or so, 45 years ago. Um, but in any case, this is now providing the possibility of taking an inactive integral and doing algebraic transformations inside the inactive integral. So we could go ahead, now that we've made that change of variables, we can say activate that integral, and now it will get done uh, from this form and so on. Okay, another thing. Um, okay, so to integrate change variables, we'll also deal with things like coordinate systems, so this is changing variables. This is a Cartesian integral. We want to change variables to, uh, uh, to polar coordinates. Um, that now does that with integrate change variables, another convenient kind of uh, college level calculus operation that is also useful in sophisticated other cases. Uh, related to that is desolve change variables um, for differential equations, same kind of idea as with integrate. Um, but now for, for differential equations, and we, we get a result there. Okay, talking about calculus, we can kind of go a little bit beyond the college level calculus story and talk about fractional differentiation. So you can get the first derivative, the second derivative, whatever. This is the half derivative of x squared. Um, and uh, we can go ahead if we, if we take the half derivative and we take the half derivative again, it will be the one-th derivative or just the derivative of x squared being 2x. Um, and in general, we can ask what's the general derivative of uh, the alpharith derivative of x squared. There's a result in terms of gamma functions. Um, the same thing can be done for negative uh, derivatives. So that's the minus one-th derivative of x squared, which is otherwise known as the integral of x squared. Um, and uh, uh, in general, fractional differentiation is hard. And uh, it's kind of at least as hard as, um, as uh, uh, integration. Um, there's the uh, half fractional derivative of cosine x. Things, things rapidly get pretty complicated. Let's, let's um, look at uh, something like this. 
um, might take a little while to compute the result, um, but there's the answer. And um, uh, so fractional differentiation is kind of the continuation of differentiation to the fractional case. Um, it's not the same. There are many different forms of kind of going fractional. Um, in our physics project, we've been much involved in d-dimensional space for fractional d. This is not quite the same thing. This is fractional derivatives, which is a different kind of concept, um, but an interesting one that's becoming quite popular these days. Now, there isn't just one definition of fractional differentiation. There are many. Another one that we now support is Caputo differentiation. Same thing for x to the half, but um, uh, for functions that aren't zero at zero, the Caputo derivative is different from the what we're considering the default fractional derivative. Um, and uh, we can do all kinds of wild things, you know, like, like there's the uh, Pyth derivative. Um, we're computing, uh, a, a solving a differential equation for the Pyth derivative of uh, y of x is equal to y of x. So it's kind of like, um, it might be something like uh, exponential decay, except that it's not exponential decay, it's the pyth derivative is equal to the function or the exponential growth or whatever. Um, and the result here comes in terms of Mittag-Leffler functions. Okay, next item in math. I kind of showed something fun in the post here. Um, this was from a, uh, uh, a bug report which was filed by uh, Jerry Kuiper, who, who was an early developer of mathematical morphism language, who sadly um, died in an accident in, um, uh, in the mid 1990s, um, had worked a lot on our early numerical computation capabilities. But this is a bug report from Jerry Kuiper saying from 1990, complaining that DSOLVE does not find solutions which occur as envelopes of more general solutions, um, doesn't find the, um, uh, um, uh, what we can call the singular solutions. Well, now we can. So uh, this is um, uh, it's not a very good format, but this is um, uh, this is the Clairaut equation, and we can uh, like uh, plot the results of that equation. And what we'll see is um, the uh, that these that we form this kind of envelope here. There's this sort of caustic line that is defined by the envelope of all of those kind of string figure, uh, individual straight lines. Um, but we don't get the actual envelope curve is not included as a solution of the differential equation. It's a singular solution. But now with the option include singular solutions, we can go ahead and get that singular sort of caustic solution as well as the general solution of all of the different sort of string lines here. And again, we could plot that and find out, yes, indeed, it is, in fact, the, uh, the kind of the envelope curve that, um, that comes at the bottom of this, this thing here. OK, another, another new function is residue sum. Um, the uh, residue sum, you might think, well, that's easy. You're just adding up the residues. But in fact, what's important there is that it's residue sum within a particular region. This is kind of a precursor to some of the very elaborate things we're going to be doing with uh, 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 contours in the complex plane and descriptions of regions in the complex plane. This is now summing the residues within that uh, within the unit circle here. OK, changing topics. Uh, new thing is you can make your own guide pages. You know, In our documentation, if we go in here and we look at um, something like this, um, this thing is what we call a guide page. It's kind of a cognitive guide to a collection of functions in the system. Well, if you're making your own functions um, or you just want to collect existing functions, you can make your own uh, guide page. And where is this now? This is under, um, uh, oh yeah, yeah, I know where it is. Um, the, uh, um, uh, if I go to the root guide page here, um, this little thing at the top allows me to make a new custom guide page. I can click that and I will get a new custom guide page that I can fill in. And then if I deploy that custom guide page, I can actually show up, have it show up, always show up in my documentation. And we can deploy it uh, locally to the cloud and so on. If you deploy it to the cloud, anytime you're logged in, in any computer, you will be able to see that 
uh, custom guide page that you've added, and it will show up on your root guide page. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I think I'm not going to get through everything today, um, but uh, let me let me get through some more things. Another area is uh, a piece of beautification. This is drop shadowing. So you can take some text and you can give it a drop shadow. So here um, in graphics, I've, I've taken this text and I've said drop shadow all those characters. So you can see that little shadow behind it. It's kind of cool. You can, you can use that as a style for a plot here. And you get this kind of, um, uh, this kind of um, pop, popping out of the page drop shadowed version of this. Um, and, and for example, sometimes it's useful to have one plot with drop shadow and one without drop shadow. And it's kind of like one was drawn on top of another. Um, it's, it's nice to have drop shadowing sometimes in, um, uh, here's a case where we're, we're doing it in, uh, in a geo map. Um, and we'll, we'll see here some drop shadowing in, um, um, in, in that map, uh, sort of pulling out the tile of Switzerland there. Um, because this is Wolfram language, drop shadowing has been generalized. So we can specify the actual distances that the drop shadow should be and what color the drop shadow should be, in effect, what the light source color is um, that's leading to the shadow. OK, another thing we have is um, uh, to do with um, uh, shading. We've got more elaborate kinds of shading. Um, here, we're making a GD6 polyhedron. That happens to be a new function. We can um, uh, shade this in a variety of ways. So this is flat shading, where you just get a bunch of facets. Uh, we also now support um, Garo shading explicitly. Um, this is now uh, using particular algorithm for deciding how light should be uh, scattered from those facets. Uh, we also have Fong shading. Um, this is another, another example. Um, Another thing in 3D graphics, it's kind of an elaborate thing, is um, has to do with uh, the controls that you have. So if I make a 3D graphic and I just pick it up with my mouse, I can rotate it around. But, but let's say I want to zoom into that graphic. I can hold down my command key and I can zoom in. That's just zooming. It's like a camera from infinity. You're changing your zoom lens, you're zooming in. But what if I actually want to walk into that graphic? Okay, so to walk into that graphic, I can press um, uh, control on a, on a Mac, it's control command. And now is that right? No, it's option. What is it? It's, ah, it's not that either. It must be shift command. There we go. Is that right? Um, yes. And so what this is doing is instead of zooming in, it's actually walking into the graphic. So now if I've walked into the graphic and I turn it around, I'm now rotating it still around the center point. And that means that the graphic, I've walked into the graphic, and so things move much further. And so this is this move in, in the movie making business. It's called dollying. You're taking the, the, the dolly that the camera is on, and you're wheeling it into the scene, so to speak, rather than just zooming by, by adjusting the lens. So now you can kind of walk into the 3D graphic scene here. OK, another thing that's come in version 13.1 is something long awaited, long discussed. It might seem like a detail, but it's really an important thing. It is the story of uh, 3D Voronoi uh, meshes. So we've been working on this for it's kind of an embarrassingly long time. It's like a decade. It turns out to be really hard because it turns out you need this representation of 3D geometry that can have the feature that you can have polyhedra that really fit together and so on. Okay, let's do it. The big, the big moment here, let's make a Voronoi mesh from those points. So this is now making a sort of a, a 3D puzzle object where we've made the separate Voronoi cells in there. So now we can, if we wanted to, we can take that 3D Voronoi mesh and we can show it as a 3D graphic. We can show it with opacity. And now we see those kind of soap bubble-ish type uh, surfaces in there in the Voronoi mesh. Um, so we could take that, uh, if we wanted to like make the puzzle pieces separately, we can just take that Voronoi mesh and they're all our little puzzle pieces, uh, assemble those together and you will get that cube um, in that particular case 
um, uh, that can be reassembled out of the Voronoi pieces around every particular point. Talking of reconstructing things from points, another thing that we have, um, we started some of this in version 13.0, but another thing that we have is the ability to, um, uh, um, uh, we have, um, oh my gosh, what is this? It's going crazy. Um, we have um, the ability to uh, take points and um, uh, there are a bunch of points and they're scattered around an annulus. Okay, can we make that annulus again? Well, there's a new function in 13.1, reconstruction mesh. And this will make a mesh that is an attempted reconstruction of that object the object that was sort of sampled from those points. Now we can reconstruct it as a mesh there. So for example, we could do the same thing for, for a torus. This would be now a reconstructed torus from 2000 points. And there you can see it's kind of a little bit bumpy on its surface, but we've more or less reconstructed the torus. Um, sometimes we would get um, uh, some reconstructions won't be as good as others. So here we're, we're just taking a, um, uh, 20 points around a circle. Our reconstruction mesh is not a totally convincing circle because, gosh, it didn't know that the thing poked out here. Um, it just uh, uh, it just went between those points there. Okay, in visualization, we've got a few new kinds of plot types. Here's one. This is a, a ternary list plot um, in uh, um, in the world of physics, sometimes these things are called Dalits plots after a chap called Dick Dalits, who I knew back in the day. Um, and, uh, but it's a way of taking uh, something where typically three values all have to add up to a constant and you're plotting them um, in a triangle. And that's a convenient way to render things. And there are all sorts of options here with, with um, uh, grid styles and so on. Okay, something that we added in, um, uh, um, in version 13 was the ability to deal with uh, ordinal values and so on. Something that we've now added is the ability to have a scaling function which specifies an ordinal scale. So we've got this ABCs and now we're saying I want to plot these with an ordinal scale ABC. So even though these values are not numerical, this scaling function, just like it might say, make a log plot or something. Now it's say making an ordinal plot that is based on these, these ordinal values, A, B, and C. So we can do the same thing with nominal scales. Those were things that we introduced in 13.0. They're now integrated into scaling functions and so on. Okay, changing topic again. We're gonna talk about chemicals. Uh, now we can talk about uh, uh, this is dealing with an amount of a chemical, something we've had in Wolfram Alpha for a long time. Uh, this is saying, I want one liter of acetone. And I can go ahead and ask questions like, okay, what's the mass of one liter of acetone? Um, and uh, the, um, um, uh, you know, we should really have something, that silly dialogue box that's coming up. We should just have a checkbox that says, always do it. But anyway, we can, here we can, um, we say, there's the, the chemical instance, one liter of acetone, what's its mass? Now, one thing we can also do is a chemical convert. So we can take that chemical instance, we can take our uh, one liter of acetone, and we can say chemical convert that into grams, and it will now convert it into a chemical instance that represents the same amount of acetone, but it's now represented in terms of grams. And we could, for example, ask uh, for that chemical instance, what's the amount of substance that we would have there? Uh, we could have something like this, and it will um, uh, give us the amount of one liter, amount of substance of one liter, and so on. Um, it's it's more fun if you have something like this, where you have a um, uh, where you're doing where you're sort of computing, uh, generating a bunch of let, let's generate a bunch of just uh, uh, sort of hydrocarbon. Um, uh, just carbon polymers effectively. Um, and uh, now we can ask for each of those, what will be the amount of substance associated with one gram of each of those? Um, so we can go ahead and do that. And we see it's a decreasing number of moles because um, the molecules, individual molecules weigh more. Now we can do some much more elaborate uh, conversions 
that actually use thermodynamic properties. So for example, here we're converting, uh, we're finding for water at a particular temperature, um, what, um, uh, what will be the volume of that mass of water at that temperature. This is using the thermodynamic data that we have built into Wolfram language. Also in chemistry, chemistry I'm realizing, I have realized recently is much more like, uh, it's kind of like we've got molecular scale pattern matching going on. So here we've got the notion of a pattern reaction where we have a molecule pattern. It's like an expression pattern, except that instead of the blanks being filled in from arbitrary expression elements, tree-like expression elements, the blanks are being filled in from pieces of molecules of actual atoms and so on. And so this is a pattern reaction that defines how uh, the, the left-hand side, you can see it, it has this kind of mouse over thing. It shows how the corresponding, mole uh, corresponding atoms, uh, where they land up, in the final result. And there are these, these kind of dangling ends onto which we can have different things added. So uh, for example, we can apply that reaction. So this is kind of like replace for chemicals, uh, replace for molecules. And, and by the way, some of the replace for molecules might be coming more literally than one thinks as we apply the formalism of our physics project to molecular computing. Um, but this is applying that reaction, applying that pattern reaction to this collection of molecules, to this pair of molecules here, this is basically in code implementing a chemical reaction. And so, for example, we could take the result from that chemical reaction and we'll find out that uh, we can plot it and we'll find out we got uh, water coming out from these chemicals. I don't know what these chemicals are. I, I, if you ask me about particle physics, I can tell you uh, all, the, all the elementary particles are my personal friends, but I'm afraid that's not true of chemicals yet, at least I hope to learn that kind of stuff. Um, but in any case, that's, that's, that's how that works. Now you can apply functional programming as well if you want to, to molecules. So here, for example, you can think of it as sort of functional polymerization. This is nesting the application of a, uh, a reaction and we're getting more and more complicated molecules. And if we say molecule plot of that, we'll see that the result of nesting that um, ap application of that uh, reaction is this is these progressively more complex molecules now this is sort of as i say the precursor this is just in code we're seeing what would happen in the chemical reaction this for me is a precursor to understanding sort of how you go the other way and go from chemicals back to functional programming okay next set of things i'll talk about and i let me see what i'm going to be doing here uh let me see yeah, I think I, I think I'll um, maybe I'll just give you a little bit of a of a of a quick summary of some of the rest, and maybe we come back another time and talk about things in more detail. So um, this is uh, the next thing to talk about is PDEs. We've been having this kind of long running, very long journey, quarter century journey, um, to add sort of practical PDEs to Wolfram language, and this is kind of another step, um, in uh, um, in this story, sorry, why did that jump? I don't know why that jumped, that shouldn't jump. Um, shouldn't jump when we resize. Uh, so this is about um, constructing PDEs for kind of real world things. And we've had this idea of a diffusion PDE term that represents a piece of diffusion. Um, this now uh, is sort of adding to that, this is, the notion of axisymmetric regions. So there's some heat diffusion in a cylinder. Um, another thing that we've been adding, we started adding elasticity. Um, and uh, this is now uh, dealing with the specifying the properties of solid materials. Kind of there's an analog of viscosity for solid materials that kind of tells you how, how well a, a solid material kind of goes back to its original form. It's like a rubber material. How quickly, how easily does it go back to the original form it had? I actually didn't know about these things before diving into this, this functionality in our system. I knew about fluids quite a bit, uh, worked on that quite a bit, but not about solids. In any case, this is um, various parameters that characterize solids. And now we can say, here's a piece of rubber that's being kind of non-linearly stretched. And we have notions of hyperelastic materials and things like that. I was very pleased that I, I happened to drop in on a company that's making very deep use of our technology uh, in a very practical setting. And uh, we were talking about um, new things we're adding and they were like, um, you know, talking about 
the various elastic computations they do. And uh, turns out they need hyperelasticity, and it's like, well, we just added that in version 13.1. So, I, and I said, you know, I wasn't sure when when our team was talking about adding hyperelasticity to the to the system that that would be something that would actually be of sort of practical use. And they're the first of set of people who are PDE users out in the real world. They say they need hyperelasticity, so that was kind of nice. Okay, so a lot of stuff on PDEs. I mean, there's giant monographs that we've written about PDEs. We've added another one in um, uh, in version 13.1 about hyperelasticity. Okay, next topic, interpretable machine learning. It's kind of a, a question of when you get a result from machine learning, how did that result come about? What was the important things? What were the important features in the input that led it to give a particular through machine learning to give a particular output. We have a new thing called feature impact plot. That's a, a way to kind of indicate what impact different features had on a particular result that you get. Now it takes a little while to interpret the interpretation of this machine learning stuff, but this is kind of a way to, to dig in a little bit to kind of knowing, well, why was my, you know, why did you decide that this was not a ripe banana? Well, it's because the most important feature was that um, it was light orange, or the most important feature was that it was still uh, quite small or something. This gives you an idea of what was the feature that had the highest impact in determining that particular result. Okay, another fairly technical topic, model predictive control. This is adding to our whole control system capability stack. Um, this is... Uh, I always have a hard time understanding how all this works until or unless I actually have an actual control system I might try to build. But this is um, uh, we can in, in our control system creation system, uh, we can take a symbolic specification of a control system and actually take it all the way down to the code that you need to load into your Arduino to actually implement that control system in a practical device. Next, we have algorithmic and randomized quizzes. This is part of our quiz generation system. Uh, actually, some of this is coming just the next week or two through a Packlet update in the field update. Um, this is uh, adding to our ability to author a quiz as a Wolfram language notebook, deploy it, um, as and, and, and then be able to uh, uh, have people take the quiz and have all the results come back and so on. And we're, we're actually making use of this ourselves. Uh, actually, we have a summer school and summer camp going on. I think our summer camp, um, I think our middle school summer camp uh, already made use of some of this um, quiz capability, uh, randomized quiz capability. We'll be making more use of that in the coming couple of weeks. Okay, a bigger story here is the ExpoStruct data structure. So one thing that we've added in connection with the compiler is built-in raw data structures. And so one of the things that, uh, and so those data structures can be things like linked lists and all kinds of other things that are just raw data structures that you can poke at and do things with as raw data structures. They're just things that are as inert as a list of numbers or something, uh, but you get to have functions that poke at those data structures. Uh, so what we have here is the ExpoStruct data structure. This is the same data structure that is used inside the internal code of Wolfram language, but it's now exposed as a data structure that you can poke at. So it's kind of a way of having completely manipulable code effectively. You have an expression which can represent code, it could represent a program, whatever else. Um, it's, uh, um, it's kind of um, uh, that, that so, so you have a, a, the capability to take um, an expression structure and turn it into a raw expostruct. And that raw expostruct does nothing unless you poke at it. And you can go in and you can apply evaluation to it and so on. Uh, you can do things, you can um, uh, map immediate evaluate, you can take a function, you can insert it into pieces of the expostruct. But this is a way of kind of making kind of like an abstract syntax tree from our expressions and um, having that be something that um, is uh, is manipulable, just like data. Um, 
so this is the thing and, and the thing that's really kind of exciting about this is it slides right into the compiler once you have something represented in this form it is immediately able to interoperate with all compiled code so that's um that's a, that's a piece there um the uh Okay, I'm going to quickly talk about the compiler. The compiler is kind of a big story, which is a sort of a, a big machine that's been progressively growing over the past many, many years, and it's really reaching a wonderful point at, at, this, at this point. Um, and uh, what's come in version 13.1 is this compiler-based external code interaction. If you've got a library like OpenSSL, um, and it has a, 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 it's a C library, and you want to just um, make that library be something that you can immediately call an arbitrary, a function in that library from Wolfram language, just like you can call a piece of Wolfram language code. Library function declaration is the thing that gives you that bridge. And so this is within that library, this is the function name. This is a type specification. And you'll notice a new piece of syntax, colon, colon, bracket. That's a new uh, type specifier syntax that is part of Wolfram language. It's a C array of chars and a C int. Those are the two arguments to rand bytes, and it's returning a C int. This is low-level C code stuff, but now this declaration is a symbolic declaration that now allows you to immediately just um, uh, 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 call that function. So here, we're just saying library function of rand bytes, and we can immediately just call that function from inside this piece of, of compilable Wolfram language code. And uh, this is kind of the operation of the type system, creating a type instance of the appropriate type to be sent to that ran bytes function. And then we can just run it. And we can run it in, in standard Wolfram language top level code. And now we're executing that function within the compiled code within that library. So I'm talking here about sort of the new constructs that are occurring there and uh, a lot of stuff to do with memory management and a lot of uh, kind of um, uh, operations like casting, which are now things that, are, that you specify in the symbolic representation of compiled code. And they're things that allow uh, things to happen down inside the actual compiled code. This is uh, declaring a type for um, uh, a struct, a C struct. We can make a, uh, a, a declaration again of a function, which is taking a C struct as an argument. Now we can use the same idea with a library function. Now we can just call that C function directly from Wolfram language code, and we'll get the result. Um, there's a lot of complicated stuff to do with how memory management works. We think we have a very nice, clean way to deal with that with this managed storage class uh, for types here. Um, and that's, that's the way that works. Uh, another thing that's come in this version is directly compiling function definitions. So you've got the sort of down value specification here of uh, n blank colon equals whatever. You can now uh, declare that function and you can go ahead and compile that declar compile the, the spec compile that function using this uh, definition uh, this assignment in Wolfram language code, it will then be compiled and it will go and, and take all those pieces that have been de de defined here and do that compilation. Okay, another, um, another thing is uh, the ability to deal with expressions full, and that this kind of plugs into the expostruct idea. There's this kind of symbolic notion of an inert expression which operates in compiled code. So a note expression really does nothing in standard top level evaluated code, but inside compiled code, it gives you a way to represent an expression that you can, you can specify symbolically an expression, and this will turn into kind of one of those expostruct things inside the compiled code, and then you can operate with that on the compiled code. Well, that was a very lightning whirlwind tour of some of the features of version 13.1. There's, there's, there's still more, lots of things about um, geometric scenes, graph products, uh, different kinds of um, images in, in graphics, uh, new things in machine learning, um, lots, lots of other stuff. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the story of version 13.1.
uh, we've been, um, I think it's a rather impressive collection of stuff for the things that have kind of arrived at the end of the production line after six months of development here. Um, but this is, uh, this is what we've got in version 13.1. You can download it today. You can uh, run it immediately in Wolfram Cloud. That's been running 13.1 for the last uh, few days um, and going forward. And um, so there it is. Um, it's, uh, we're excited about it. Uh, here are some of the highlights. Threaded, video capture, chemical convert, map apply, reconstruction mesh, implicit D, and emojis. So, well, thanks for joining us. And um, our live streams may be a little different for the next um, few, uh, a few weeks because it is our annual uh, summer school and uh, summer camp. We might, uh, and our summer school at least is mostly in person in Illinois. Um, uh, that's why I'm about to travel because I'm usually in Massachusetts. Um, and, uh, but it was too difficult to do it in Massachusetts, too many regulations in Massachusetts. So we have to do our summer school this year in Illinois. Um, the, uh, uh, so we'll be doing probably some slightly different kinds of live streams that might involve actual in-person uh, audiences and things in the next few weeks. Uh, but thanks for joining me for this run through of version 13.1 and uh, see you another time. Bye for now.